guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. Man, we have a really awesome episode for you today because I have a really wonderful guest, Lila Rose of Live Action. She is a pro-life activist. She has been in the fight against abortion and for loving both babies in the womb and their mothers for many years. In a way, she has been a pioneer for this movement, especially for young Christians. And I'm just continually proud of her and impressed by her and thankful for the wisdom and the insight and the leadership that she gives in this area. Today, we are going to talk about the Equality Act. We've talked about that multiple times on this podcast. I'll link um, at least two past episodes that we've done on the Equality Act in the description of this podcast, but we're going to talk about how it relates to abortion, how it relates to uh, pro-life, the pro-life industry and the pro-life movement, pro-life organizations, charities, uh, religious doctors, and the implications, the very frightening implications that this has for abortion. And then we're also going to talk about um, what this means in the way of protections for girls and women. Um, I really want to get into a lot of different details about this, but I don't think that we're going to have time to get into all of the nooks and crannies, the legal nooks and crannies of the act today because there's so much. And actually, Lila sheds a lot of light um, into what this act means in a variety of areas, not just for people of faith, but just for Americans in general. So this is a crucial episode for you to know what's going on, to know why this piece of legislation matters, to know why it's not going away, and to resolve right now to stand up against uh, the craziness that you are about to uh, that you're about to hear about. After I have this conversation with Lila, um, I am going to give you a monologue um, about uh, evangelicals who voted for Joe Biden because looking at some of the organizations and the people who for the past few months, for the past few years have been talking about what an absolutely terrible choice Donald Trump was and how it is a vote for decency, a vote for moderation, a vote for kindness and love to vote for Joe Biden, even from the Christian perspective, to see some of these people now complain about or sound the alarm about the dangers of the Equality Act really has me frustrated um, in a lot of ways because we have been talking about this for several years. Christian conservatives have. We have talked about what a threat this is to not just religious liberty, but to vulnerable communities and vulnerable people, especially women and babies in the womb for a very long time. And are the reaction that we got from Christians who decided that they were going to vote Democrat in the past election was basically an eye roll or basically, yeah, we know uh, that's bad, but look, Trump is even worse. These tweets are even worse. The things that he said, these headlines, uh, his personality is even worse than this uh Uh, assault on religious liberty. It's even worse than uh, taxpayer-funded abortion. And so we're not going to talk about the Equality Act right now. We're going to focus on how bad Trump is, and then we're just going to continue to push people implicitly or explicitly to vote for Joe Biden. I've been watching that happen over the past few years, and only now those same people are sounding the alarm about the Equality Act. I have a lot of frustration surrounding that, and so I'm going to kind of vent that frustration um, just a little bit. But I'm going to end, of course, with um, with with love, because that's what it is. It is tough love. The monologue that I'm going to give um, is tough love towards uh, my fellow Christians who I believe made a bad choice when it comes to voting for Democrats, um, not just when it comes to Joe Biden, but also when it comes to the congressional votes as well. And so that's what you can look forward to after my conversation um, with Lila Rose. Now, before I do start that interview, I do want to tell you guys about Built Bar. Uh, Built Bar is the healthier than your fav- is healthier than your favorite protein bar, but it tastes even better. It's low calorie, it's low sugar, it's high protein, high fiber. If you're doing keto or something like that, if you're trying to do high protein and uh, you know good fats and uh, low carbs, then Built Bar is a really great option for you. And it's not necessarily 
for losing weight, although it could be used for that, but it's not necessarily a diet bar. It's just a healthy way to tide you over in between meals. Each bar contains only 110 to 160 calories, about 16 to 20 grams of protein, and only three to five net carbs. And it truly does taste really, really good. They've got 18 different flavors. They're all covered in 100% chocolate. They've got caramel brownie, they've got cookies and cream, they've got peanut butter, they've got mint brownie. If you're like a fruity person, they've got uh, raspberry chocolate. And so they've got a lot of awesome options and it really is so good. And if you want a discount, if you want 20% off your next order, then go to builtbar.com and use promo code relatable. That's the name of this show, builtbar.com, promo code relatable for 20% off your next order of Built Bar. Lila, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Can you first talk about Xavier Becerra, this HHS secretary pick, who he is and what he represents in the way of uh, abortion? Yes, great question. So it's a big deal what's happened with um, recommending Xavier Becerra to be the secretary of health and human services. First of all, he's a lawyer, an attorney. He has no medical background whatsoever. So he's holding one of the highest positions for health in the country. Um, but most seriously, he has been the one of the most extreme pro-abortion activist politicians we've had in, I think, history, certainly in California. When he was the attorney general here, he was the one who actually levied criminal charges against David Delighted and Sandra Merritt, two friends of mine, because of their undercover journalism of Planned Parenthood, exposing them willing to sell baby body parts. And this is instead of um, going after Planned Parenthood and and working to investigate what their misdeeds are, he went after investigative reporters. Now, this was especially serious because um, other journalists have never been prosecuted in the state of California for undercover journalism. So this happens regularly. You know, you've had other news groups in California go undercover um, to expose, you know, illegal marijuana or to expose factory farms, but that has never happened where they've never been actually uh, prosecuted the way that pro-life journalists have. So the double standard is egregious. It was clearly a political prosecution, and it's still ongoing here in California. He also, as attorney general, uh, required or or worked to demand that pregnancy care centers, so pro-life pregnancy centers, had to list abortion notices in their facilities or undergo tremendous fines. So he, ha- he was trying to force, in the name of a choice, of course, trying to force uh, pregnancy centers to actually list abortion notices in their centers um, to effectively make them advertisements for, uh, make, make them market abortion. So he has been um, on multiple counts, extremely pro-abortion. And I think we can look at the current Biden administration. I mean, Kamala Harris is our VP, as you know. She was actually the one who, before Attorney General Becerra, you know, before Becerra became attorney general of California, she was attorney general and she handed off her seat to Becerra. And when she was attorney general, she was the one who sent state agents to raid David Delighton's house as a prolific journalist, his apartment. And she was the one who actually started those proceedings. And Becerra, when he became AG, he continued them. So the combination of these California politicians, Kamala Harris as vice president, and now um, Xavier Becerra being uh, pr- being uh, appointed to Secretary of Health and Human Services is a really a, a, a potentially not just lethal one for preborn children and the policies that they would push, but it's trying to they actually are using the force of law to penalize pro life activism and pro life reporting so that those who are even trying to protest or stand up against the abortion industry at large in our country will now face prosecution and, and persecution. It's a it's a huge concern. And, um, you know, we, we this shows the extremism, of course, of the Biden administration on abortion. And you can tell he's a very deft politician because when he has been questioned over the past couple of days, trying to kind of pin him on where he actually lands on abortion restrictions and abortion in general, he's very good at kind of avoiding those questions. Senator Mitt Romney asked him why he voted against a ban on partial birth abortion. And he kind of just said, you know, people have different convictions about that. Uh, They have different beliefs about that. And then you saw the pro-abortion lobby saying, well, you know, partial birth abortion, that's not a real thing. That's not something that happens. So that question is irrelevant anyway. Is that question irrelevant? Well, it's, of course it's not. You know, partial, late, very late-term abortions happening in our country by the, by the tens of thousands 
And um, Becerra, you know, definitely was very uh, squishy in his response. He was not willing to actually respond to Romney's line of questioning. Um, he ha- didn't have a good response because he promotes and he supports partial birth abortion, but he wouldn't admit it. I mean, that's the part that's so, um, you know, deceptive. He's he's for these things. It's clear his record as a legislator before becoming attorney general in California when he was in the legislature, um, when he was uh, in, in the uh, representative, his r- record is clear on this. But at the same time, he's refusing to even acknowledge it. Um, another line of questioning that was very powerful was Senator Ben Sass. Uh, interviewing him, um, interrogating him really about his role in using, you know, his position to go after the nuns um, to try to go basically to fight a federal law that would protect nuns from having to give out contraception. And this is that famous case where the little sisters of the poor were being required to potentially required to give out contraceptive, including abortifacients. And he was the one who was leading the charge against them. So when Senator Sass was saying, why were you going after nuns repeatedly um, in this line of questioning? Um, Bastera would respond by saying, oh, it's not about nuns. It's about rule of law. I mean, he would continuously try to avoid uh, admitting and acknowledging his extreme bias, not just for abortion, but as a bias against those that stand against abortion, whether it's David Zelayden, Sandra Merritt, or nuns who have nothing to do with contraception and oppose abortion. So it's a it's an all around terrible pick. And it would be frightening to see what he would do as our Secretary of Health and Human Services, and what that would mean for not just preborn children who are already being killed by the thousands each day, but for the activists and the advocates, and even the business owners or the nonprofits who are standing up for them. So tell me what you think the implications or consequences would be to have him as, as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He doesn't have a background in health or health care at all. Mm-hmm. Like you said, he was attorney general of California. So the politician. Yes. Yeah, so what would his role yeah. be and how do you think that would actually affect abortion and abortion policy and pro-life sinners and Catholic charities, Christian, you know, other kinds of Christian charities? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you think that would that would influence what's going on in the abortion industry and in the pro-life industry? Well, first of all, we know that anything that was done in the last four years under President Trump will be undone. Some of it already is undone. So there was a ban on Title X funding to go to abortion providers. So that that is going to be undone. Um, Obviously, there's things like the Mexico City policy that was already undone by executive order, reversed by executive order. So now taxpayer funding goes towards abortion overseas. But what I think he could do is, I mean, really the the bureaucracy or the 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 legal lease that um, runs a lot of federal programs and the money that runs through those federal programs, I can see him uh, tremend- really favoring abortion chains and especially abortion chain Planned Parenthood in using his department to fund them even more. So right now, Planned Parenthood receives over half of a billion in taxpayer dollars from the federal government. I think under Bastera, he will not only remove any restrictions to them, but he's going to use whatever he can on the administration side to allow taxpayer funding for abortion. Now, technically, the Hyde Amendment prevents that. Um, that's something that President Biden has said he wanted, wants to undo. He flip flopped on that. He wants to basically make it so that federal money can directly reimburse for abortion. But there's a lot of other ways you can help fund abortion besides directly reimbursing. Um, You can fund Planned Parenthood's other services. You can promote Planned Parenthood's other services. You could favor them and in forms of Medicaid distribution, the, 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 the distribution of Medicaid money. So I think we can anticipate that a lot of the favoritism for federal money for who gets it will be will go to Planned Parenthood. He's demonstrated favoritism to them already um, by going after pro-life reporters. And I think we can expect to see more of that. Here's the problem, Ali. It's very difficult to track some of this stuff mm-hmm. um, because there is so much uh, regulation around different elements of you know federal funding of healthcare. And because of Obamacare, there's so much leeway right now for health and human services. That's the problem with big government. There's so much space for him to sort of play um, with existing laws that have been passed. And his job is to, of course, um, administer them. So anything right. to do with health care. So I, I, you know, the sky's the limit for him in his role. And the problem is we don't have a Congress that can check his power right now. And certainly not a president. So it's it's a it's a it, it 
it, it's a very serious problem. From a faith perspective, I think I think Xavier Becerra identifies as a Catholic. He said something about his mother praying the rosary. We know Joe Biden identifies as a Catholic. Kamala Harris identifies as a Baptist. So these are all people who profess to be Christians and yet are very adamantly pro-abortion. Does that trouble you in particular as a, a Catholic woman of faith? <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. It's, it's, um, a really, uh, in, in, in many ways, the worst kind of lie to use the faith of Jesus Christ, the religion of Jesus Christ, um, to justify the killing your promotion of the killing of preborn children. And that's what the president is doing. President Biden, that's what um, Pelosi has done for decades. And that's what now Becerra, I think, is doing by referencing his faith in a political context. He's saying that his so-called faith, I should say. I mean, I I think that there is a crisis in the church, in the Western church of catechesis. So there's a lot of a, 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 a challenge with ed- properly educating people on what Christianity even teaches, but they should know better. I mean, it's pretty clear that God says, thou shalt not kill. Um, abortion kills. Jesus Christ gave his life for us instead of taking lives. I mean, that was the example he, he set. And he said that no, any man, no man has any greater love than this, that he'd lay down his life for a friend. Um, abortion is the antithesis of the example that Christ set. So there's no excuse. And I think it needs to be called out. And the, one of the greatest shames is when it's not called out by leaders in the church. Um, so that's why I think people like I'm grateful for you, Allie, and your voice. I think we need to continue to call this out because they're trying to normalize uh, this idea that you can be Christian and support killing children. And if you repeat a lie enough times, it's easy to accept it and just move on with your life because continually fighting the battle um, just takes grit and it can be tiring. But we have to keep fighting the battle and say this is a lie. And it's a lie that costs the, the lives of millions of people. Yes, and you do that so well, pushing back on those lies. Uh, Can we talk about something else that is uh, very confusing for a lot of people, and that is the Equality Act and what it actually uh, has to do with abortion. Most people don't know that the Equality Act has anything to do with abortion, but it actually does, right? Yes. Well, first of all, it's it's so, again, the lie, using lies to cover what they're doing, it's the Equality Act, it's the farthest thing from equality. It's actually enshrining discrimination um, in our law and forcing discrimination in our law. And and the two biggest victims of that discrimination, the biggest one is pre-born children. I'll explain that in a minute. But the second biggest one are women, because now women have been erased, basically. The law says that um, you're you're a, you're a female, or you're you're basically the gender that you decide, or that you identify with the, the stereotypes of it, and your biological your body doesn't matter anymore. So right. if you're a woman and you're you know on a sports team, or you're a woman and you're in your locker room, and you're a man who says I identify as a woman, all of a sudden you have you get to be in all those places, and the fact that you can never get pregnant, you don't menstruate, you actually aren't a woman. Those facts don't matter anymore. Um, but preborn children are also at huge risk with this piece of legislation. And that's because, again, the devil's in the details, the way that they uh, include. And so, you know, the idea of making um, sexual orientation or gender identity the same as sex, which is the same as um, race, which is an immutable characteristic. So now people's opinions about themselves um, are now an immutable characteristic that gets federal protection. Um, which means you get to decide, you know, again, you can go in a woman's locker room when you're a man, but it also talks about pregnancy and it talks about um, pregnancy as a medical condition, which is actually a kind of a code word for to include abortion, because in in laws past, it has included um, abortion, covering abortion, because if you are pregnant and you have a medical condition, abortion would be a medical treatment for that quote unquote condition. And so what this means is that now if a woman is seeking an abortion, if she's or if she's being pressured into abortion, whatever the case is, and you are a doctor or a nurse, it is now like being a racist to refuse to uh, commit her abortion. So now it's the same for a doctor. If a, if a, a, a person of color came into their waiting room and they said, I'm not going to serve you. I'm a racist. I'm not going to serve you. That would be discrimination. It would be unlawful. It would be just as unlawful in the same category as racism. For someone to come into your Christian doctor's office and say, I want an abortion from you and for him to say, I do not, I cannot do an abortion for you. So this is a severe attack 
on not just religious liberty, because obviously people of faith should be pro-life, but on anybody. Mm -hmm. You're now saying that if you are a medical provider, you are required to commit an abortion or to help someone have an abortion. Otherwise, you're as bad as a racist under law. And this is where this is a a huge Trojan horse um, in the legislation. It's very deceptively written. So it's difficult to see this on face value. You read the 30 pages and you're like, okay, don't see, you know, don't be talking about abortion. But because of how the they're categorizing pregnancy as a medical condition and making it up to par with your immutable characteristic, like your race, all of a sudden the treatment of that medical condition can be considered um, you know, your right to the degree that you're being discriminated against if your doctor won't give you an abortion. So this doesn't just affect um, doctors and nurses, this could affect nonprofits um, and businesses who are going to be told they have to pay for abortions. This removes the, the legislation also, Ali, specifically says that religious um, exemptions don't apply. Mm-hmm. And that's really scary. So that means the existing case law that says or, or law that says that, you know, if you're a non for profit, like, you know, um, Hobby Lobby, you don't have to provide contraception, whatever it might be, um, not just contraception, but abortion, that is no longer going to apply. So it, it, it is a earthquake to existing conscious exemptions um, in law today. And it could increase the numbers of abortion because it can also be used for federal funding for abortion. Because now for the government to not pay for an abortion when it's your right, it's like discriminating against you because of the color of your skin, that can be applied to the government too and to taxpayer funding. So this is um, a dramatically uh, uh, harmful legislation that again, because it's deceptively written, very few people are even talking about this and it's about to pass the House of Representatives today and then we'll go to the Senate. Right. And it's that same line of reasoning, as you were saying at the beginning of your answer about expanding the definition of sex and sex discrimination to not just cover pregnancy, but also to discuss, uh, cover so-called gender identity, which means a variety of things like allowing men into women's spaces, like you were saying, but also in the same way that uh, a healthcare provider would be forced to perform an abortion um, if requested of him or her. Uh, a, a similar situation would also be the case in, um, for example, if a teenage woman said, you know, now I identify as a man and I want a double mastectomy to be able to have a body that more aligns with my so called gender identity. Um, a healthcare service provider in that industry would then be required to perform that service, whether or not he actually agrees with it, conscience-wise, faith-wise, or he just, in his own medical judgment, doesn't think that it's um, a good thing to do. This law is also saying, no, that would be discrimination, like discriminating against someone because of their race. So it completely wipes out conscience protections, religious liberty protections, in particular for doctors, but like you said, also for businesses, for organizations, for Christian business owners and Christians uh, in general. Um, so this is a very, it's a frightening law. Go ahead. And and also schools. I mean, this, yes. I'm a parent, I know you're a parent and my our children are very young, but um, schools, not just public schools, but potentially private schools and charter yeah. schools, and maybe even home schools, maybe even what you teach your children in your home, because now um, teaching your children that your biology, your immutable characteristics was written into the DNA of every single one of your cells with your sex chromosomes, that that is actually not your gender, that your gender is what you decide. And you know that, that is now going to be bigotry. That is by law considered discrimination, not just to make choices around that, like having a women's only bathroom or a women's only sports team, but to teach that. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like teaching racism, um, you know, specifically like proactively teaching racism, they're equating it to that. So yeah. this can affect, you know, school curricula, it will affect school curricula, because now children are going to be taught this as no, they already are taught this in many public schools, but now if a private school isn't teaching this, I think there could be definitely, um, you know, with the right federal uh, uh, you know, p- p- person the, 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 with the right um, lawsuit, this could actually, I mean, I, I can see Xavier Becerra going after a, a Catholic school to say, why aren't you teaching? Uh, why aren't you teaching non-discrimination when it comes to sex? You know, I can see that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that is going to be catastrophic. That means our, we can no longer teach our children about their God-given biology. Yeah. We have to tell our children, you get to, we don't know if you're a boy or a girl yet. You get to decide that. 
um, which is, I think, devastating to a child's psychology and sense of self. And it certainly goes against um, nature. So yeah. that is another area which we have only begun to see the potential fallout from it. And it could get really, really bad. Oh, man, there's so many implications to that that we could explore. I think that you did such a good job and um, an important job in pointing out that they are trying to equate race with sexuality and gender identity. And therefore, they are saying that there is um, there's nothing morally contentious about disagreeing with this idea of gender identity as separate from biological sex. And I feel that if I were someone who cared, you know, if, if I were someone who had experienced racism myself, or if I were, a, you know, um, looking for protections based on race, I think I would be highly offended by this idea that race is the same thing as a man declaring mm -hmm. himself a woman that seems to kind of um, de-emphasize the importance of not discriminating yeah. against someone based on race. The waters get and very, very muddy. I, I agree. And it's, it's much more than that, though. It's not just saying um, a man can declare himself a woman and everybody has to play along with that, including doctors and schools and, and, and you know women's sports teams. But it's also saying that if you teach otherwise, you are a bigot. Right. If you teach otherwise, if you say otherwise, you are as bad as a racist. Mm -hmm. And we also, you know, we haven't even talked about the uh, consequences for churches and for, um, for marriage, because already, as you know, marriage is under attack. Marriage has sort of lost its, um, its reality in, in our public square as between a man and a woman, lifelong. But it means now that if you're a Catholic church, you're a Baptist church, and you won't do a same-sex wedding, that is as bad as not willing, being willing to do a wedding of people because of the color of their skin. Yeah. That is what this law does. So now we're talking, you know, schools, we're talking, you know, it's, this is much bigger than bathrooms. This is much bigger than bathrooms. We're talking the way that children are taught to see their own, the, their own selves and what we're allowed to teach. We're talking how our churches are allowed to marry and churches potentially being shut down if they were completely shut down because now they are refusing to comply with anti-discrimination laws. And so now they are, um, you know, either forced to do same-sex weddings or, you know, intersex weddings or whatever kind of wedding that anybody wants, um, or they're shut down because again, the Equality Act specifically says religious exemptions don't apply. And these aren't just religious, this shouldn't just be about religion because it's also just science and biology, but exactly. it is basically saying, if you disagree, you're gonna be in trouble and you're a bigot. Yeah. And I also think that you do a good job of making the argument on its merits. Obviously, religious liberty is important, but so often conservatives are afraid to just argue for, for example, that, okay, no, we shouldn't even be having this conversation because men aren't women and women aren't men. We can't just push this conversation into the realm of constitutionality and religious liberty, even though that is so important. We have to we have to have this conversation in the moral sphere because that's what the left is doing. The left really doesn't care whether or not this infringes upon religious liberty or what the First Amendment says or what the Constitution says about protections for churches and Christian schools and things like that. They are concerned with what they see as the morality of not being able to, quote, discriminate against someone based on gender identity. And so we have to meet them in the moral conversation and have that discussion first of what is good, what is not, what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. We have to be willing to have that foundational conversation. I think before we move into the realm of talking about religious liberty and constitutionality, conservatives so often kind of like push the conversation into that realm. The left isn't having that conversation. They're having a moral, ideological conversation about gender identity and abortion. They're really not concerned with the constitutionality yeah. of that. Yes, I think that's an excellent point, Allie. I totally agree. Um, we can't just, you know, try to build a little ghetto around ourselves and say, okay, we are the religious people over here and this is what we believe. What we believe is not such even a matter of belief. A lot of it has to do with um, scientific realities. You know, biology is not bigotry. The fact that I am a woman, I have, um, you know, a, a female sex chromosomes does not mean that I am um, you know, I can change and all of a sudden become a man because I whim it or because I, you know, change my, the, my physical um, external characteristics or because I 
um, you know, have a personal preference, you know, some other way. We need to engage that debate directly because that's the source of the confusion. And the religious liberty argument, I think, ultimately will be a losing argument if it's steamrolled by this higher moral ground that they're claiming. Um, the good news is we have the truth on our side, not just the truth like in a, in, you know, in a moral sense, but in a, in a scientific sense, the science around gender ideology, most of it is, and a lot of the studies I've read, it's a, it's a lot of junk science. It's not built on, um, you know, the, the realities of our bodies. It's built on a lot of um, uh, focus group, case study type stuff that has to do with people who have serious um, challenges. You know, a lot of them are struggling with gender identity um, themselves, but that doesn't mean that that struggle isn't something that should be treated and cared for instead of um, lifted up as actually a form of freedom or empowerment, which is what the left is trying to do. So the more we get into the debate directly and 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 debate on the merits of the of the argument instead of just saying leave us alone, I'm religious, um, the more effective we're going to be in actually yeah. helping people. And you know, it's, yeah. it's really about helping people and serving people. Yeah, and going on the offense too, not only just saying, hey, it's not. It's not bigotry to believe these things, but actually saying in the positive sense that it's actually love to believe these things, that we are calling for love of the most vulnerable people, uh, babies inside the womb. We are calling for love of the body that God has given you. We're talking about loving God's creation, protecting God's creation, and having a culture um, that reflects that goodness and reflects that love that we have of the bodies God gave us and uh, babies in the womb and all kinds of vulnerable people. So it's actually a message of love that we have, certainly not a message of bigotry. And I think conservatives, in particular Christians, have to do better at at pushing forward that positive message rather than only, you know, being on on the defense. Yeah. Um, And if if you have, I mean, if you have same-sex attraction or you have gender dysphoria and you're, you know, struggling with your your sexual identity, um, that doesn't mean you should be discriminated against. I think we can all agree that we should not mistreat or discriminate against someone because of their desires or because of their own struggles or because of their own attractions that um, what matters is what people choose to do with those things. And and then, of course, that we treat everybody with equal dignity and respect. So I think that that should be the message that we're not wanting to discriminate against anyone. In fact, we want to help others and see their God-given dignity equal. All of us have this equal God-given dignity, but it is um, to, to, to recognize a struggle and call it a struggle. You know, if someone's saying, you know, even they're a biological male, like I'm a female and to, to say, this is a struggle. We want to serve you in this struggle instead of we want to um, make the struggle your entire identity right. and, and, and basically doom you to your struggle. Um, you know, the suicide rate for transgender kids and, and adults is, um, is, sky, is sky high. I mean, it's, it's dramatically higher than for other um, young people or for other adults. That, that's not helping people to push them towards that that identity. So I think that needs to be part of our message too. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell people how they can support you? You have a book that's coming out. So please tell people what it is, yes. <laughs> where they can buy it or pre-order it, and then how they can support you in live action. Thanks, Allie. So thank you so much. Yes, I'm coming out. I know you've been through the author thing. Congratulations on your book last year. Um, I am coming out with my first book in May. It's called Fighting for Life. And it's really a guidebook for everyone who wants to stand up and do something about what's happening in our culture, whether it's on abortion or really any cause that we think is important. It's the lessons I've learned over the last 15 years about standing up when you're feeling unsure of yourself, um, overcoming mistakes, knowing what to say when you're not sure what to say, um, having courage to stand alone when other people are against you and, and opposing you. So it is, I hope, encouragement and inspiration for people. And that comes out on May. It's available for pre-order now. And then liveaction.org is our website um, for um, our pro-life work. We know we're, we're the digital leader in education. So we are daily putting out content to change hearts and minds. And we hope it's helpful to you, especially if you're talking to friends about abortion or you're wanting to learn more yourself. There's a lot of resources for you there to learn more about this issue and how to be a very persuasive pro-life advocate yourself. So check that out. And we're also all of our social media. You can look at look at that too. Awesome. And we will put the pre-order link to your book in the description of this podcast, uh, just so everyone knows exactly where to get it. Lila, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You informed us um, a lot on these two areas, not just in relation to abortion, but in relation to the so-called culture wars in general. So thank you so much. 
Thanks for having me, Ali. All right, before I get to my little monologue, my little rant, I want to tell you guys about another sponsor, and that is Patriot Mobile. They just expanded their coverage dramatically, which makes it easier for Americans to get rid of the big name carriers who charge way too much and then donate all of that money to left wing organizations. Uh, You need to switch to Patriot Mobile because they never send a penny to these leftist organizations that really hate you and hate your values. They never want to silence you. They are America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. You can switch with confidence because they use the same network as the larger providers, but they charge a lot less. And switching is super easy. You can keep your phone number. You can bring your own phone or buy a new one. Uh, You can build your own bundle with multi-line discounts and save even more doing that. All you have to do is go to Patriot Mobile com slash Allie, A-L-L-I-E, or call their U.S.-based customer service team at 972-PATRIOT. That's 972-PATRIOT. Veterans and first responders get even bigger discounts. So go to PatriotMobile.com slash Allie, uh, where they will... Uh, and you will get a, a free premiere activation where they set up the phone for you in a special gift if you use promo code Allie, or you can call 972 Patriot. So that's patriot.com, sorry, patriotmobile.com slash Allie or 972 Patriot. So, as promised, I want to speak for a second to the evangelicals who have spent the past few years um, and especially the past few months leading up to the election, either explicitly or implicitly condemning a vote for Donald Trump as a vote for hate and hailing a vote for Joe Biden as a vote for love and decency and respect and dignity and normalcy and moderation and all of that. These are our Christians who say that they care very much about obeying God, both publicly and privately. Uh, Many of them claim to even care about religious liberty, and yet they outright insisted or, or at least just implied that voting for Trump was worse than anything that Biden and Democrats could ever do, could ever usher in. There are organizations who claim to be bipartisan, who say that they care about religious freedom and protections for LGBTQ people, who are only now sounding the alarms on what the Equality Act actually means when they had ample opportunity to do so ahead of time. Uh, These are Christians saying that this is the greatest legislative threat to religious liberty that we've seen. And to them, I just have one question. Where have you been? We have been saying this about this bill for years now. We have raised the flags about this for a very long time. We tried to warn people that if you vote for Democrats, this is just one thing that you will be getting. They haven't tried to hide this. We tried to tell people, look, Biden isn't keeping a secret about who he is. He is not a moderate. He is for taxpayer-funded abortion through nine months. He is against religious liberty. He is against school choice for predominantly poor students. He is for men having access to women's spaces. He is for haphazard immigration policy. He is for the toxic lie that is critical race theory pervading government agencies and the military. And a lot of you just rolled your eyes and said, yeah, but Trump, Look at what Trump said. Look at look at this headline. Look at how bad he is. Anyone who votes for him is a racist, and that's the worst thing that you could do. Voting for Joe Biden, we were told, is a vote for kindness and for love. That's what a lot of you said. And I agree. Trump has some very serious flaws and failures, obviously. But I do not want to hear your concerns about this legislation that you basically have had nothing to say about for the year leading up to the election that Joe Biden said that he supported. If you are really concerned about it, you should have talked about it just as much as you talked about how mean Trump was. The the truth is, the fact of the matter is, the evangelicals for Biden crowd decided not to heavily highlight the things like the Equality Act or Biden's pro-abortion agenda before the general election or before the Georgia special election, because at the end of the day, they still wanted people to vote Democrat. They decided that getting the the mean orange man out of the White House was more important than conscience protections for doctors who don't want to perform abortions on a kicking, moving, feeling unborn baby or who don't want to surgically castrate a teenage boy who now identifies as a girl. 
They decided that beating Trump was more important than ensuring girls could go to the bathroom or change in the locker room or compete in sports with only girls. They decided it was more important than ensuring that women in prisons or or in abuse shelters would be protected in women only spaces. They decided that making sure Trump lost was more important than ensuring taxpayers aren't forced to fund abortions. And in, in exchange for what? Like, what did they get for their vote for Biden? They got a guy who has said and continues to say as many allegedly racist things as Trump has, who said that poor kids are just as smart as white kids. He said that he doesn't want his kids to go to school in a so-called racial jungle. He said that he can't even go into a 7-Eleven without hearing a person with an Indian accent. He authored a crime bill which has disproportionately affected black and brown communities and who uh, is now going to do what for so-called racial justice, support more funding to Planned Parenthood and oppose school choice? What will Biden and Democrats accomplish in this area that Trump did not? You didn't get better facilities at the border. All you got is Washington Post changing their language from, quote, kids in cages, which is what they call the border shelters under Trump, to, quote, influx facilities, which is what they're calling them now. Either way, by the way, they were built by the Obama administration, I will note, which should tell you how utterly affected so many people were by the media hatred of Trump and the glossing over of Biden, including the Christians who voted for Biden, who thought that they were making a good exchange. One day, The long tentacles of the Equality Act and progressive totalitarianism will come for your church. It will come for your pastor. It will it will come for your kid's school. It will come for your daughter's sports team. It will come for your local women's shelter, your florist, the pro-life pregnancy center that you sponsor, your business, your speech, your beliefs. And I do wonder if then you will realize that your vote in the name of supposed decency was not worth it that you linked arms with people who hate you and everything that you believe in. I have many qualms with the Republican Party, but understand, Christian, that the Democratic Party hates you. And they dupe so many people every few years into thinking that they care about religious people's rights and beliefs and that they are the party of compassion. And the fact that they can convince people of that, even while openly celebrating abortion and gender confusion in kids and having absolutely nothing to show in the way of compassion is honestly so remarkable. They're amazing at PR and advertising, marketing, messaging. And look, I believe that if you voted Democrat, Uh, You did so because you thought it was the best thing to do. I don't think that you're some bad person. I, I certainly don't hate you. I don't think that you're stupid or anything close to that. I just think that you were wrong, that you were very wrong. And I just want to be candid and saying that it's hard for me to hear and see some of you complaining about this legislation and policies and nominees that so many people warned you about for months on end. And I'm not saying that Trump was the perfect candidate or that you had to have voted for him to be on the right side. I think faithful people decided to vote for neither candidate. But even so, you could have at least expressed some concern over Biden's radicalism before the election. But you didn't because, again, at the end of the day, you felt that defeating Trump was more important than protecting taxpayers from funding abortions or Christian doctors from being forced to perform sex change surgery. And I simply believe from my perspective, that you made a bad trade. And maybe you're realizing that. And if that's the case, I'm not angry. I'm not shunning you. I'm not canceling you. I'm not in any way gloating, certainly not, because I'm not happy about it. But as the saying goes, elections have consequences. And now we are going to continue to live with these. But it's not too late to speak up. It's not too late to push back. And I would argue as a Christian who cares about these future generations, who cares about these vulnerable populations, that it is your obligation to do so. All right, that's all I've got to say about that. Uh, I will see you guys back here on Monday. 